Hi, welcome everybody. Warburton's Baker's Born and Bread. Just one cornetto. In Britain, there are some food and drinks brands we love so much Ooh. that they feel like they're part of the family. In all truth, who eats the most of these in our house? You. You! <laughs> I'm Helen Skelton. Oh, my word! And I'm going behind closed doors... Beans, beans, hands. ..to discover the secrets... <laughs> ..of some of the world's biggest super brands. Without the yeast, there is no Guinness. So are we going to see a load more Cocoa Pops flavours? We'd have to kill you if we told you that. <laughs> I want to find out how they make the things we love... Are you ever going to find the perfect potato? Maybe not, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try. How they build their global empires... Tell me how you get to be... How do I get to be the big cheese? Yes. What have Walker's done right? You know, they get the right people to do their adverts for them. <laughs> <laughs> and what gives them sleepless nights? We have got to try and rescue that brand from where it is now and make it into what it should be. You're at your most vulnerable when you're at your most successful. Can I have a pint of Guinness, please? You've got to be patient when you're waiting for a Guinness, haven't yeah. you? <laughs> You've got to wait for it. <laughs> Look. I let it settle. We have on the time. Guinness is the largest brewer in the world of the distinctive looking beer known as Stout. They sell 1.5 billion pints every year. Thank you so much. Look at that. It's iconic, isn't it? Even if you don't drink Guinness, when you say Guinness, you can picture what it looks like. The harp glass, the really distinctive dark colour, the thick, creamy head. This is a drink that has been one of Britain's favourite tipples for over two centuries. Let's see, shall we? I think I should put a flake in it. Being Irish, we absolutely adore Guinness, and it is a staple part of our diet. Guinness is magic, man. Mm. Guinness. Please drink sensibly. This multi-billion pound brand is famous across the globe. Its beer is sold in 120 countries. Pop stars, presidents, and royalty alike Slaughter. are all proud to be seen drinking what's often referred to as the black stuff. But can a beer with such a unique taste appeal to the next generation? Do millennials want a heavy, hearty stout, or are they all choosing gins or craft beers or fruity ciders? Because people's tastes and trends are changing. How does a beer goliath like this stay at the top of the game? Beer is the biggest selling alcoholic drink in Britain. The three most popular types are lager, followed by stout, then ale. When it comes to stout, the number one brand is Guinness. And although Britain is their largest single market, it's brewed in 46 countries around the world. I've come to its birthplace, Dublin, to discover the secret of its global success. Of all the factories that we have been to on this series, there is something monumentally different about Guinness. This is an occasion. This is a tourist attraction. You walk down the street and it's exciting because of the history and the heritage and the culture of it all. And that's a culture that's wrapped up in, in fun and storytelling and warmth. The only downside to today is that it's a bit like bringing a kid to a sweet shop and saying you can't have any sweets because at six months pregnant, I'm not entirely sure they'll be too happy about me downing pints of Guinness as I walk around. I think that that should be done in the name of research, but apparently that is irresponsible. I'm here to meet Martin who is master brewer overseas production and is one of the few people who knows the beer's secret recipe. Hello. Hi, Helen. Welcome to Dublin. Thanks. Welcome to St. James's Gate, the home of Guinness. 
I'm starting at the site of the original 18th century brewery, which is actually Ireland's number one tourist attraction. The Guinness story began in Dublin in 1759, when an aspiring brewer called Arthur Guinness signed a 9,000-year lease on a disused brewery at St James's Gate. He began brewing ale with his son, before turning his hand to a new beer that was distinctively dark, called Porter. By 1799, the St James's Gate Brewery was devoted to brewing porter, which soon evolved into stout and the Guinness we know and love today. Oh my, what's this? This is the old vat house, actually. This is a stunning building. So come on in here, Alan. So was this an original vat? It would have probably been around 1800s, OK? But this building in which it's housed would have likely been signed off by Arthur Guinness himself, you know. And how much Guinness would have been made in that on a daily basis? Because that's big, but it's wood. It's big as well. It's about 300 barrels, so 500 hectolitres. And this is a link to the history. It's the craft tradition. It started back in 1759 with Arthur Guinness himself. It's alive today. And all we're simply doing here is passing on the baton, as it were. After brewing beer in Dublin for over 250 years, the company opened their most advanced facility yet. Welcome to our famous brew house four. To me, this is like some sort of out of space experience. It's very shiny, yeah. very big, very warm, and completely different to what we've just seen, isn't it? Yeah, and yet everything we do within it is the same as we would have done down through the years except it's a modern, up-to-date facility. We're brewing 24-7, mostly all year round. OK. 27 pints of Guinness every second. So it's a very rapid process. 27 pints of Guinness a second? 27 pints of Guinness a second. Despite all the technical innovations, the raw ingredients remain the same, and the main one is barley. The brewery uses over 100,000 tonnes of Irish barley every year, and so it's a massive contributor to the farming economy of Ireland. OK, this is a sample of the materials that we use uh, as routine in Guinness. This is our roast. We roast barley at 232 degrees C. That contributes the famous Guinness colour and unusual coffee-type flavour. Ooh, yeah. It's yeah, a bit can... like roasted coffee beans. You can smell the roasting, yeah, can't absolutely. you? Yeah, And what is this? This is malt. When we take barley from the field, we then send that to a malster who converts it into malt. They fool the grain into thinking it's springtime in the field. It kind of starts to sprout and it breaks down its own sugar as energy. That's strong smelling as well, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It? I mean, malt does contribute its own unique flavour. And hops, which is added in the kettle process where we extract alpha acids. So is there a written down recipe or is it a kind of manipulation of what you guys think is best? Well, no, there is a predefined recipe. It's a, it's a constant recipe, but the adjustment is the tweaking. It's the tweaking around the edges that bring out the constant output. And where is the recipe? Is that commonly known? Uh, it will be known to brewers uh, and obviously known to our quality people, but we try, try to keep it at that. <laughs> I was going to say, I can keep asking you in different ways, but you're not going to tell me what it is, no, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> the roasted and malted barley is finely milled to create grit. Water is then used to extract the natural sugar from the barley in a process called mashing. It's the sugar that will get turned into alcohol by fermentation using yeast later in the process. Next, the grain solids need to be separated from the liquid in the lauter tun. It's like a coffee percolator. You're ready to withdraw liquid from it. It's going to be hot, right? It's going to be hot. A coffee percolator is the perfect analogy because I can see that straight yeah, away. Yeah. Wow. So the grain that's left behind then will be cleared away and sent off to farm for the livestock. So your waste product isn't a waste product? No waste product here. Everything has a link back into the chain. Brilliant. The sugary liquid they end up with is called wort. Hops are added to give the beer its familiar bitter taste. But it's not Guinness yet. It needs gas and alcohol, and that's created by a tiny microorganism called yeast. A unique strain of yeast is used to ferment Guinness, and it's kept in a secure room known as the library at minus 196 degrees centigrade. 
Hello, you must be Dan. Hello. <laughs> they said come to the library. I'll be honest, it's the weirdest looking library I've ever seen. This is where we store our Guinness yeast under liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees Celsius. All of the Guinness yeast actually relate back to the original yeast that was actually isolated in 1903. That's a mad concept to get your head around, isn't it? So in 1903, you isolated some yeast and from that you've been able to make Guinness all this time. Yes, I mean, it's the yeast that has created the Guinness brand and the Guinness product. So actually, without the stuff in these tanks, there is no Guinness. This is where it all comes from. Yes. The yeast can be kept safely at these freezing temperatures indefinitely. Ooh. This is how we store the Guinness yeast in these cryo vials. We then transfer it to the lab and we grow it up. And then from there, we then disperse it to our breweries. Once removed from the vault, the yeast is given a thorough health check before being grown in the lab for four days. And then from there, we then transfer it to these little slopes. We then send around the world to our breweries. And that can go off to make the beer? That makes the beer, yeah. But as raw ingredients go, the yeast has a massive effect on the end product. Oh, absolutely huge. Not only does it provide CO2, so it gives the beer its fizz, and obviously we have the alcohol as well, a number of the flavours that you enjoy is actually a consequence of the yeast. So could you taste a pint of Guinness and go, someone didn't do the checks on the yeast there? <laughs> no, because that wouldn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> The Guinness yeast is used to make eight different varieties of stout. In breweries across the world, we are fire in our hearts. Including bottles of foreign extra stout, we are made of black, which makes up over a third of global sales. Despite Guinness being one of Ireland's oldest brands, they actually sell more beer in Britain and Nigeria. All the Guinness sold in Ireland and the UK is brewed here in Dublin. The whole process takes eight days. But before the stout can be delivered to your local, it first has to get past the palates of some very serious tasters, led by global head of quality, Steve. Steve, what did you give 414? For 8.5. It's good. 8.5. Yeah, and I gave it an 8. Five. What do those numbers mean? They're rated from, say, zero to nine, and um, exceptional and very good quality, roughly at around eight to nine. And what happens if it scores less than seven? That beer is obviously not released. What we would usually do then is maybe get two more kegs from that same batch and bring them back through and then retaste. But if genuinely the panel is not happy with anything, it doesn't go out. I know you are responsible. But at half ten every morning, because you're not spitting it out like a wine taster, you're actually drinking it. We wouldn't have any more than eight samples in the morning. And um, you only take, like, one swallow, really. But by the time you leave here at four o'clock, it'll be well out of your system. To be honest, I definitely underestimated the amount of care and attention to detail that goes into making a pint of, you know, dark beer. So what I want to find out next is, how did they turn this fairly plain-looking beer into a global superstar? If there's one thing better than a trout... ..or a chub, it's the bottle of Guinness Supporters Club. It's a bottle of Guinness Supporters Club. In Britain in the early 20th century, Guinness was only sold in bottles. Sales were generated by word of mouth. The brand disapproved of advertising its beer. But by the end of the 1920s, the economic depression had led to their beer sales slumping. In a bid to stem the decline, Guinness reluctantly published their first ever advert. However, it gave rise to one of the most famous advertising slogans of all time. Guinness is good for you. To learn more, I've come to meet their archivist, Evelyn. 
so this, Alan, is the original, very first Guinness ad. It was 170 years after Guinness was founded before we advertised for the very first time. Hang on, it was 170 years before you even needed to do an advert? Exactly. Um, and famously, the head of the Guinness family uh, was actually very reticent in having his name put up on billboards. Um, and he was brought around by one of the head brewers at the time who advocated for the fact that the advertising would be as good as the quality of the beer. The thing that I love about advertising is that it's such a snapshot of social history and it takes you back to the thinking of the time, which is hard for people to appreciate. And I think that shows in this first advert. It's health-giving value, Guinness builds strong muscles, it's nourishing properties, Guinness is one of the most nourishing beverages, richer in carbohydrates than a glass of milk. I mean, you couldn't say that now, could you? No, you absolutely couldn't. So if you think what was happening in, in Britain in 1929, it was the year of the economic depression, and if you were at home and you were having your hard-earned money, you were going to spend that on goods and on foodstuffs that you thought were going to be nutritious, that were going to be good for you and your family. And that's where Guinness is good for you and all of those health claims come from. Now, nobody would ever advocate drinking alcohol when you're pregnant, but I've not imagined it, have I? But there was once upon a time, I'm sure my mum said to me, oh, you drank Guinness after having another baby or when you were pregnant. Again, not something that would be endorsed in today's world, but at the time, there would have been extra iron um, in Guinness and doctors are on record as prescribing Guinness to people if they had lost blood, including women who had given birth. So after, not before. After, yeah. The Guinness is good for you slogan was a huge success and opened the doors to a whole series of campaigns led by the artist John Gilroy. I love this advert, colourful toucans, where did that come from? Yeah, so the toucan is so identifiable as the Guinness bird, no matter where you go around the not world. Not many toucans in Dublin though. Not many, no, not many at all. Originally, the advertising agency came up with the idea of using a human family to advertise Guinness. And John Gilroy, who was the, the genius behind a lot of the later Guinness artwork, the story goes that he went to the circus one day, saw a sea lion balancing a ball on the end of his nose, and thought, actually, wouldn't that be kind of quirky if the sea lion would be able to balance a Guinness on the end of his nose? And suddenly, the idea of creating a human family to advertise Guinness morphed into a menagerie of animals. And of all of the animals, the toucan was really just the one that caught the public's imagination the most. He was just that little bit more exotic, a little bit quirky, really colourful, and he's been our symbol from the mid-1930s right up to today. Next time you order a pint, ask for a Guinness and say a little birdie sent you. These slogans and cartoon characters firmly established Guinness as a household name. Many were immortalised in pieces of memorabilia that have become valuable collector's items. My name's Troy. Welcome to my Guinness collection. It's my best cabinet. The jugs. Two salt and pepper pots there, what I started with. And then that was it. Things got out of control. This is where, originally, I was just going to put a few knickknacks. It's gone a bit further than that, as you can see. And here is where I go to bed every night, thinking of drinking the next pint of draft Guinness. Guinness gives you strength, and after work we've all agreed. Guinness is what we need. Despite being a well-loved brand in the UK, by the 1950s, bottled Guinness had around 5% of the market and was struggling to compete with draft ales. Guinness needed to find a way to beat them at their own game. Then in 1959, they hit the jackpot when a Guinness scientist, Michael Ash, invented a revolutionary dispensing system which added nitrogen as well as carbon dioxide to beer, producing the classic creamy pint of draft Guinness known throughout the world today. The nitrogen creates the famous surge effect, but it also created a major marketing problem. <laughs> For it to be served correctly, 
Draft Guinness takes just under two minutes to pour and settle. The challenge for the brand over the following decades has been how to sell a beer you have to keep customers waiting for. It takes 119.5 seconds to pour the perfect pint. Guinness's Good Things Come to Those Who Wait campaign portrayed patience as something to aspire to. He waits. That's what he does. And I'll tell you what. Tick followed talk followed tick followed talk followed tick. The brand's unconventional advertising reached an all-time high with their 1999 surfer commercial, which has been voted the best ad of all time. Here's to you, I have. And the fat drummer hit the beat with all his heart. Guinness spends tens of millions on advertising to help maintain their status as the world's biggest stout maker. But in the age of social media... A Guinness drinker with a bad pint and a smartphone is a risk to its reputation. Two years ago, Guinness fan Ian started an Instagram account called London Guinness, dedicated to the pints that would have Arthur Guinness turning in his grave. He now has an army of 185,000 followers. Ian, how did this all start? What was the moment that made you think, I'm going to set up an Instagram account dedicated to pints? I love Guinness. Like, it's my drink, heaven in a pint. So I guess when you order a Guinness, you expect a certain level, you expect a certain standard, uh, and if something goes below that standard, uh, that's where London Guinness is. I guess if I was a big brand like Guinness, I wouldn't know if social media is a good or a bad thing. Because for want of a better word, you could be a keyboard warrior who has the potential to do damage to a massive global brand. It's good because it kind of gives like, power back to the consumer. What is this about? That's the prime example of a point with no head. And so, is that offensive to a Guinness drinker? Absolutely. Like, it's like part of the glory of a Guinness is that you have like creamy head. So when you get a pint that has no head, it's actually nearly more offensive, I'd say, than a pint that has too much. Are you sure? Because look at this. I mean, that is half and half. If you're looking for uh, value for money, I would say you're getting more bang for your buck with a small head. I can't believe that someone's handed that over. That's on the extreme <laughs> end <laughs> of bad pints, I'd say. The really deadpan comments. Like, somebody's put up a picture of a Guinness in a carling glass and all it says is 10 Hail Marys. Yeah, just... That's the... That's it. That's the price. I think that's one you'd see quite often in, in London, to be honest. What's wrong with that? Sadness in a glass. The Guinness head should be smooth. But when you have, like, 40, 50 bubbles, you know it's going to taste like battery acid. Maybe this is a sweeping statement, but people who drink Guinness seem to have a... It has to be right. Yeah, it's like the Guinness drinker is a superiority complex. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> it is. Some of my friends do take the out of me saying I'm the Guinness police. Honestly, like, I never worked at a bar, so, like, it's... A little bit rich of me to, <laughs> to be the on the Guinness man. Um, but I know no pub wants to serve a bad Guinness. You know, saying, like, got to make sure the Guinness isn't too bad because you don't want to get, like, roasted by this Instagram account. If it just helps pubs get better pints or for punters to get better pints when they're ordering a the Guinness, then that's the, that's the job done. The London Guinness account helps to keep Guinness quality executives like Chris and Dennis on their toes. It's their job to get the spanners out and troubleshoot problems in pubs across the UK when pints of the black stuff are not up to scratch. How did you feel when you saw London Guinness posting pictures of terrible pints? In fairness, it put me in a pretty bad mood straight away. I spoke to the team, spoke to Chris and the guys and said to them, look, as soon as we get a post on this page, we need to be in there within four hours. And we were turning up at pubs that didn't realise they were getting slagged off on social media, showing them the post, doing a full quality reset in the outlet, getting them to pour a perfect pint and then posting the perfect pint on their website and showing the consumer that actually we're responding to, to Guinness quality. So we just want to find out where our beer isn't great and do something about it. That's our job. It's been a long time since I worked in a bar. So I'm going to see if I can still pull a pint that won't offend Chris and Dennis. Attention. Little finger underneath, glass at an angle, fill carefully to the harp logo. The smell is so distinctive. Move the glass to an upright position, then stop. OK. 
Okay. And wait. It's 119.5 seconds for it to settle. <laughs> it really is about making sure that the nitrogen all rises into the head and the CO2 falls back into the beer. There's 300 million bubbles in a pint of Guinness. And He's you, counting them. Yeah, people would tend to rush that pint now. But actually, that last piece is the most important because you just fill in the head full of nitrogen, all the CO2 is dissolving back into the liquid. And that's where you get that complex taste with Guinness. OK. If it's poured correctly, you should get a slight dome on the top. <laughs> and if it's not poured correctly, you'll never speak to me again, will you, Dennis? True. So Chris will now will test, test it. What are you doing to test it? Why not just drink it? We have three measurements. The head size, the temperature, and then, obviously, the taste. So what should the perfect head measure? Between 12 and 18 millimetres. And that's to comply with law. By law? What By law? By law. What law? <laughs> the law is that there needs to be 95% liquid left in the glass after the head has subsided. Right. OK, and how are we looking? Very good. D Dennis is looking You've underwhelmed. You've a very good point. <laughs> Dennis looks like that normally. I'll reserve judgement, Helen. Now we're going to measure the temperature. So we're looking for that to be between 6 and 7 degrees. Right. And we've got 6.7. That's, that's pretty perfect. much perfect. Very good, very good. So finally, Helen, the third measurement is the taste. OK. Delicious. So, do I pass? You pass. Nothing from Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> very good. They are doing a serious job. They are doing quality control. And with a brand like Guinness, you cannot underestimate the value of quality. It's what their brand is built on. Every bit of that pint is checked for perfection. For crying out loud, who measures the head of a pint? They do. Who checks that the glass is facing the right way? They do. Like, you cannot underestimate the level of detail and commitment that goes into making sure those pints are perfect. Over the centuries, beer has traditionally been associated with male drinkers. Even now, men are around three times more likely to drink beer than women are. Why do men drink beer? Because they like it, I suppose. <laughs> it's a man's thing, you know, to go and have a pint with the boys. Well, I grew up in Belfast, so um, most of the bars had a lounge bar. The husband would go into the public bar and the wife would go into the lounge bar. We wouldn't go into a pub on our own, let alone buy a drink. No. When you had a girlfriend and you went out for an evening, you'd go out for a drink. I mean, you'd have a beer, but they wouldn't. It wasn't acceptable for us to drink beer, us being yeah. women. Um, it wasn't ladylike. The last thing I think of is a, a lady with a pint glass in her hand. Looking back at it, I think it's, uh, it was sexist. Sorry, yeah, it's a bit biased. <laughs> Get me a Guinness, love, would you? Back in the 1960s and 70s, beer adverts were mostly targeted at men. Dear. Thanks, lad. Why don't you get one for yourself? If you've got to fetch and carry, do it when you're shopping. But by the late 1970s, Guinness sales were falling, and the brand's response was to broaden their appeal with a series of ads depicting women Guinness drinkers as sophisticated and savvy. By the mid-1990s, the brand had fully embraced changing attitudes, launching their first TV ad featuring only women. Three decades later, I want to find out if times really have changed and if Guinness appeals to the next generation of women drinkers. Yeah. So, ladies, I don't see a pint of Guinness between you. Absolutely not. Absolutely not? <laughs> Why do you say absolutely not? To be honest, I haven't tried it. I don't like the look. Guinness looks thick. Like, it looks like a meal. Like, you almost need a spoon <laughs> to finish it. But it's that important to you what it looks like holding a drink? Yeah. Do you know, I actually have tried it. It's really big in the African community. <laughs> so I've got uncles that, like, literally love a Guinness. Like, it's nice when you try it and then that aftertaste after, I thought, oh, I don't know if it's for me. I like this kind of 
cocktail and stuff. <laughs> You've gone for a gin, why not the Guinness? Yeah, so I've stuck to a gin and lemonade. Um, I guess Guinness isn't my first choice. I always sort of stick to gin or Aperol Sprit or wine. I mean, I do like it, I don't hate it. It's just not my first choice. I'm seeing one pint of Guinness. Talk me through these choices. I like well, Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> Guinness definitely wouldn't be my choice. <laughs> um, but I also associate it with my mum. When she was pregnant, um, she was recommended to have Guinness. They said, oh, you know, it's full of iron, it's really good for you. So your mum sounds like she's got quite an affectionate relationship with Guinness then? Yeah, yeah. So, like, every now and again, she'll still have a half of Guinness because she quite likes the taste. Who do you think drinks Guinness? Old white men. Or, like, Jamaicans, because I feel like Guinness Punch is... Is that not a...? Oh, yeah. yeah. Talk me through what kinds of things you might drink. Well, starting with beer, you know, I like different types of beers. You'd be quite happy drinking a pint? <laughs> I would really be OK drinking a pint of beer. I'm just a fan of beer in general. Guinness, IPAs, or different beers. The number of beers now available in Britain has exploded over the last decade, with the rise of craft beer and its market value has almost doubled in this period to over a billion pounds. To get an independent view on this beer market revolution... Hello! Hello! ..and to see what might be in store for Guinness, I'm meeting award-winning food and drink writer Melissa Cole. So, tell me then, who is Guinness aimed at? Well, Guinness would definitely tell you that Guinness is aimed at everybody, which is actually should be the case for any brand. But the fact of the matter is that historically it has been aimed at men. When advertising first became big business and Guinness became a big advertiser, it was middle-aged men who held the purses, held the power. There has been the mindset that women don't have their own disposable income, women don't like to drink beer. Roll forward, not that much changes. Roll forward, not that much changes. Just recently, craft beer came along and it said, oh, we don't give a monkeys if you're an octopus, would you like to try our beer? Um, and that was the huge difference. There are loads... If I walk in here as a punter, there's loads of things I could choose before I pick a Guinness. Yeah. The difference now is, is that, that, that people aren't so one brand for life, one beer for life anymore. They are more experimental, particularly the generation that's come up with craft beer. Is Guinness at a tipping point? You know, if they don't get the next generation in, it, you know, is the future bleak? Alcohol consumption in the UK is dropping year on year, has been for over a decade now. So the new generation of 18 to 25s are drinking less than any other generation before them. But they still want to go out and be sociable. And if you want to save pubs and you want people to still come out, you have to have great quality non-alcoholic beers and non-alcoholic spirits as well, for want of a better phrase. So if you do not engage in making a quality non-alcoholic beer at this stage of the market, then you are frankly a fool. The rise of non-alcoholic beer is an unexpected twist in the tail for Guinness. With Generation Z embracing teetotalism and drinking around 20% less alcohol than their parents, they're redefining attitudes towards booze. They demand the taste, the nightlife, but not necessarily the alcohol. To find out how Guinness is responding to the moderation movement, I'm meeting innovation brewer Ashling. You must be Ashlyn. Hello, nice to meet you. She had the daunting task of creating a stout without booze. We all love Guinness. We know lots of people do. But we wanted to produce um, a Guinness without the alcohol so that it could be enjoyed in more occasions and give people an opportunity to, to have Guinness when they maybe don't want to choose alcohol. Tell me about Guinness Zero, then. How, how long has it taken to get this to market? Yeah, so we've been working on Guinness Zero for almost four years now, which seems like a long time. But we really wanted to not compromise on the flavour and really wanted to deliver the best quality um, and a Guinness Zero that tastes just like Guinness but without the alcohol. So talk me through that four years, then, because you guys have almost set yourself the impossible task. You've got a product that people have loved for years the world over and you want to make the same thing but without a key ingredient. That's not an easy thing to achieve. No, it definitely was a challenge. Um, 
when you take away the alcohol, you take away a lot of the flavor that takes away some of the body and obviously it takes away the mouthfeel, the alcohol warming that you get. So there was a lot of work that we did to, to try and ensure that it was as close as possible. We actually start with Guinness. We gently remove the alcohol with cold filtration process. Ah, so it is Guinness and then you've taken the alcohol off. Exactly, yeah. Beer doesn't like heat. So we wanted to select a technology that was really gentle and left as much of the Guinness character as possible. There was a whole team that worked through hundreds and hundreds of different recipes before we landed on the last, um, last one. I think we're a little bit surprised ourselves on how close that we actually managed to get it to taste and to have that look and feel. It's exciting, but it's quite a responsibility, isn't it? Because Guinness is iconic. Yeah. We're obviously here in the Guinness Open Gate Brewery. We're in the pilot scale where we develop the recipes, but then we had to scale it up to the, the large scale. So the, the breweries in St. James's Gate have really nailed it. No brand is bulletproof, even one with two and a half centuries of success and brand building. You know, successful brands move with the times, they evolve, they change and they react to trends. And I think that is exactly what Guinness is doing by launching Guinness Zero. It'll be fascinating to see how it plays out. The countdown to the UK launch of Guinness Zero has begun. The brand has a long history of invention, and after four years in development, this alcohol-free stout is their biggest innovation in the UK in over 30 years. Like regular draft Guinness in a can, it relies on a clever device, which in 1991 won the Queen's Award for Technological Achievement, beating the internet. In every can of Guinness, there's over 250 years of brewing tradition and a widget. The widget is a small plastic ball that holds nitrogen under pressure. When the can is opened, internal pressure is released and the gas creates the familiar surge, creating the iconic creamy head. The widget brought the experience of a pint down the pub into people's homes. Ooh. I think that might be a widget kicking in. It's the, it's the theatre of watching a pint of Guinness settle. There's nothing else like it in the world. There's very few other beers you'll actively wait for before you drink. TV ads are known for being some of the best in the business. So I'm fascinated to discover how they will market a stout that for the first time in their history contains no alcohol. With just days to go, I'm meeting head of Guinness GB, Neil, and his advertising team. From an advertising point of view, is a no alcohol Guinness an easy thing to market? Anything to do with Guinness is, uh, in theory, easy to market because they've got this incredible prestige and history, but um, the reality is, is that the creative benchmarks are so high that you really do need to work at it. You know, the first big innovation in 30 years, the last one that was the widget, which actually won out in the Queen's Medal Award against the internet yeah. when it, in 1988 when <laughs> so, it was so first the, launched. the bar is very high. Yeah, so it was just making sure that when you land with Guinness that it makes as much of an impact as it really should. smouldering, wasn't he? He was there. <laughs> the music's working really well, yeah, I think. Better. Um, it feels yeah. very dynamic, really matches the cuts, um, really carries the narrative. I think it's, it's looking yeah. awesome. In terms of stuff still to do, we obviously need to re-record the voiceover. I think we just want to make it sound a little bit less voiceovery, make yeah. it sound a bit more natural and authentic. Yeah. And then we just need to drop that percentage sign off the end line, and then I think we're in a good place on the TV. With an advert like that, are you trying to get Guinness drinkers over to drinking a non-alcoholic version, or are you trying to get new people? 
Guinness Zero is aimed at Guinness drinkers, so it gives them an option. Um, I think when you look at the brand, it's, you know, one of the core values is communion and kind of bringing people together over a Guinness. Um, and so actually where it's really nice is, let's say, you know, you're a group of friends, one, everyone's drinking Guinness and one person doesn't want to drink. They don't feel left out, so everyone can still be in that moment together. Who's your biggest competitor in the no alcohol world? Heineken. Zero has done a great job at kind of really expanding the non-alcoholic beer category since that was introduced over the last couple of years. Um, you know, they put a lot of investment into their plans and I think that's really opened up non-alcoholic beer. But nevertheless, you know, there's a lot of people who go, a meat-free sausage, but it's not a sausage. Like, the, those people will say, an alcohol-free Guinness is not a Guinness. There are some naysayers. I think there were certain people who were a little bit concerned by it, but the uptake online and the feedback that they've got from influencers, from some pretty um, stern critics, has been fantastic. I think how we like to think about it is we're respecting a 260-plus-year-old history, but really looking to, to the future so that we're reflecting changing society and changing culture. And does it taste the same? It very much tastes like Guinness, but without the alcohol. It's a bold claim, and despite being pregnant, I can put it to the test. So I'm back in Dublin to meet Steve, the global head of quality, and Mark, the global head of beer, to find out how they create the same Guinness pub experience selling a pint of non-alcoholic stout. This pub seems to me like a pilgrimage. It's everything that is Dublin, that is Guinness, that is Irish. I feel like I'm cheating on Guinness to say I want a zero alcohol Guinness, and I bet I'm not the only one. There are a lot of people who are diehard Guinness fans, and Guinness to them is Guinness Draft in a pint glass. But Guinness Draft was developed in the late 1950s and launched in 1960. So people who would say you can't do anything with Guinness are talking about our youngest member of our family. We have always innovated and we will always innovate. But that's quite a tricky balance, isn't it? Respecting the heritage, which is key to what you do, but reinventing yourselves. It's something that Guinness has had to do because it's been around for like 260 years and therefore always has to reinvent itself for the next generation so that people don't just see it as their mum's drink or their, their dad's drink, but something relevant for them. We have this kind of expression, whenever we're doing something new, that it has to be OGCD, which stands for Only Guinness Can Do. So if we're doing an ad or, or the way we do our sponsorship or the way we do a new product and it's like something that another beer could do, then it's not right for Guinness. Tell me about this bit of kit then, because this is very different. You know, it's not just the product, but how you're serving it is an innovation, isn't it? Yeah, so this is Guinness Microdraft, is what the unit's called, as it comes in a, in a small can. Okay. So I pop the can in, so there's no ring pull on it. It reads the temperature of the unit, tells me the temperature is good, so I'm good to go. So I'm a Guinness Zero glass, hold it in the same way underneath at a 45 degree angle, and I pull the handle. Two part pour? Two part pour. It'll do the first part automatically for me now. We're using pressure here to um, push the Guinness out through the spout. And the spout here is creating the famous Guinness surge and settle. As it gets to the top of the harp, the unit will stop automatically. So I'll just leave that down there. And there's a little timer on the back here, so the handle won't work now to top up until the 60 seconds has elapsed. It's a way to help bartenders to know how to serve Guinness. Take follows talk. It very gently finishes off the dome and finishes the pint. So, do you want to try it? I absolutely do. Guinness in Dublin. Everyone tells me it tastes best in Dublin. Now, I think you know that I would be honest, but that is surprisingly really good. I'm not a regular Guinness drinker, but if you're telling me that it's about the occasion and the experience and the beauty of the glass and those sensory overloads, all of those boxes have been ticked. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers. Today I'm going to test the difference between our regular 4.1% Guinness and the 0% alcohol Guinness. Which is going to be interesting, because I drink quite a lot of this and I've never drank this. They're supposed to be exactly the same, but we shall see. Looks really similar. I'm going to mix them up so I don't know which one I'm actually drinking. I'm going to go ahead with the 4.1% Guinness. Oh, yeah, I absolutely love it. It's just so creamy. 
So this is zero alcohol. Oh, I really don't know. Where's that other one? The difference in, in taste is absolutely zero. My first thought is these two do not taste the same. Okay? It's really, really difficult. <laughs> it is missing something, which I guess is the alcohol. But also I feel like it's missing a bit of the body. It's got a bit more of a zesty flavour to it, but other than that, that's, that's actually really nice. And they are pretty close. That's the ordinary draft. And this is the Guinness Zero. Well, you're correct. Am I? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> very close. I'm glad because I bought four of them. When you think about Guinness, they have been a non-stop success story for 260 years. You know, they have built their brand to be iconic, to look cool, to be loved by generation after generation. Oh. I think of all the things I've learned about Guinness, you know, the fact that people come and buy the t-shirt even if they don't drink the beer is testament to that brand success. But there's no doubt that Guinness is going to have to evolve and change in order to cater to a different generation of customer. And it's going to be fascinating to see what they do and how they do it. I suspect it's going to be a success, though. So cheers to that. Three cool tarts and sculptures and impressive showpieces. Bake Off, the professionals stream the series so far on all four. From curses to incredible treasures, modern science is used to try and explain strange deaths. Tutankhamun, Seekers of the Tomb, new and next on Channel 4.